normal, I call mundane. The ordinary or the standard has become the boring and the predictable. Beneath that thin layer of routine or commonality, there's something waiting to rise, something begging to be unleashed. The only question is, are you ready to break free? Well, howdy, New Spring. Everybody good on all our campuses? So excited you guys are here, man. It's, uh, it's been a great, it was a great football day for everybody. Clemson won, Carolina won, Georgia won, and that's really all that matters in this area. I know, listen, don't push back. Don't push back. I know we got some Big Ten transplants, and uh, sorry about that. Anyway, so um, it, it was a great day, and, and I'm really excited because um, this week, my first book comes out, Unleash. Really excited, and I just wanted to share this. I just wanted to share this with everybody at New Spring. If you're an owner, we don't have, if, at New Spring Church, we don't have members, we have owners, because members have rights, but owners have responsibilities. And so I just want to read you the dedication in this book. On the bio, or this says, the, the, this book is dedicated to all the amazing staff, staff members and owners of New Spring Church. Who knew that's what... Um, who knew that what's happening now could ever take place? I'm so honored that Jesus has allowed us to have the front seat and see Ephesians 3.20 take place right in front of our eyes. God is faithful. We have seen great things. But hold on. The best is yet to come. And so that's the, that's the dedication of the book. <laughs> Available in stores Tuesday, online Thursday. And I'm, I'm really excited and nervous. People are like, how do you feel about your book coming out? Excited and nervous. Because... They say that writing a book is a labor of love, and so you want your baby to be pretty, right? And some of you might push back and go, every baby's pretty. Uh, I've seen some ugly babies. Oh, can we be honest? Can we be honest? Like somebody showed you a picture at work one time, you're like, whoa! Anyways, I, what's that? It's my child. Oh, dear Lord. Okay, so um, we're starting a brand new series today for, all, for everybody joining us and for those online watching, and we're just so excited, called Unleashed to coincide with the book. And for those of you that are new to New Spring, what we'll typically do in a series is we'll take about two, anywhere from two to eight weeks, and we'll talk about a topic that really, uh, we'll, we'll just wear it out is what we'll do, and then we'll switch to another topic. But this, this series is so important because I think so many people aren't living up to the life that God has called us to live. In fact, I would say this, for every person at every campus today, I believe most of us aren't experiencing life the way God intended it to be experienced. I think most of us are what I would call, um, I call it the Christian treadmill or the Christian cul-de-sac. Imagine for a second you're driving down the road and you look to your left and you see a guy and he's, he's running, there's this road and it ends in a cul-de-sac and he's running around the cul-de-sac. And he's just running and running and running. You come back an hour later and he's running around the cul-de-sac and you go by the next day and he's running around the cul-de-sac and you go back a week later and he's still running around the cul-de-sac and you're like, what is this dude doing? So finally one day you just, you just got to know. And so you, you, know, you stop and talk to him. You have your iPhone going so you can record it and put it on YouTube. And you're just like, hey man, um, why are you running around the cul-de-sac? And he told you, I'm making progress. I'm going places. I'm seeing the world. I'm, ama I'm, I'm learning so much in this cul-de-sac. You would drive away thinking, number one, he's on crack. Or number two, your heart would be broken for him because in his mind, activity equals maturity. But you would know there's so much more than the cul-de-sac. For many of us here today, there's so much more in the cul-de-sac. And I want us together over the next several weeks to discover the amazing life that God has for us, how to really live life like God intended. And today we're going to talk very specifically about the love of God because I really do believe that understanding the love of God and his grace and his awesomeness and fullness will absolutely allow us to live a life that's unleashed. So we're going to make three quick points and then we're going to dive into what I would argue is the most awkward, uncomfortable story in the entire Bible. But we'll get to that in just a little while. All right, here we go. Three points. Number one, God's love does not make sense. God's love does not make sense. For those of you who are wondering what people are doing scrambling all around you, when you walked in, you were given a bulletin, and uh, there's some blanks in there, and we love to fill in some blanks here. If you don't like to fill in blanks, or if you just get bored, you can draw on that, and that'd be great, and put that on eBay and sell it or whatever. All right, here we go. God's love does not make sense. How many, on all of our campuses, how many how many dads are here? You've got a son or a daughter, 
All right, lots of dads here, okay? Uh, Clemson had parents weekend, right? A lot of parents from Clemson, Clemson, a lot of parents, okay? Yeah, a lot of dads. Dads, I think, um, I think you and I have something in common. I'm a dad, but if we could just be honest for just a second, I don't know what moms go through, but I know what dads go through. Remember when your son or your daughter was about to be born, you had what I call a freak-out moment. In fact, I had two freak-out moments. First freak-out moment was, i got to provide for this child. You know, and how am I going to provide? And then I found out it was a girl. I found out girls are twice as expensive as guys. And that's not true. They're like five times as expensive. But <laughs> that was my first freak out. Here was my second freak out. How am I going to love her? Found out I was going to have a daughter. And I was excited, you know. But how am I going to love her? Because the love I had in my life for other people and other things, like, I had to love my family. It's like you just got to love those people. And and you don't have to like them, but you got to love them, you know? And so you're born into that family, and you just love those people. And then Lucretia and I, Lucretia's my wife. Some people go, oh, did y'all fall in love? No. We didn't fall in love because falling is accidental. Think how weird that is. I accidentally fell in love with you. We did not fall in love. I pursued her. Listen to me. I did not stalk her. I pursued her. Somebody told me between services that the only difference between a stalker and a pursuer is if you have abs. And I I don't know if that's true or not, ladies, but it's just the rumor I heard. I did not stalk her. I pursued her, and I pursued her, you know, dated for like, you know, four or five years or whatever, and we got married, and it's great. But I was was really freaked out because I was like, what if if I don't like this baby? Because I loved my life, and it was great. And what, how... Am I, there's some dads here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. How am I going to love this child? So the day comes, June 27th, uh, and and Karis Karis is getting ready to be born, right? And Lucretia and I go in the ER to give birth. When I say we, she um, was giving birth. I was sitting next to her. They were like, does she, you know, does she want drugs? I'm like, I do. And, And we're trying to work that whole deal out. And the doctor, you know, she was born by C-section, so the doctor pours out and they tell me, stand up and look at your baby. And I stood up and I saw her, and dads, it hit me. That's how you love her. You just, you just see her. I mean, I didn't, have to, I didn't even have to work. I didn't go, all right, now sit down, kid, calm down. We're going to have to work on this, and there's some things you need to know, and there's some things I need. And so you're going to, here's a list of things here. Um, it, it was like I saw her. And I loved her. You know why? Because she's mine. She didn't do a thing to deserve my love. I'll just be honest with you. She wasn't even pretty. Because some of you are like, oh, a baby's so beautiful when it's born. Uh Uh-uh. She was all folded up. And she she had an alien head. I expected her any minute to go, oh, Elliot. I... I didn't love her because she was beautiful. I loved her because she's mine. Listen to me, everybody here today. God doesn't love you because you're beautiful. God loves you because you're his. If you are a child of God, you are loved by God, and it's not based on your performance, but rather your position as his child. I would argue this. I I didn't love Karis based on her performance, the entire first year of her life. Because if you're a parent, you know the first year of their life, they do everything possible to try to get you to not love them. <laughs> you're a zombie the first three to six months of, the, of having a baby, right? And, and, and Karis, I'm not even making this up, I would get her diaper changed for the first year. I would get her diaper changed, and as soon as I got her changed, got her cleaned up, she peed on me every time. And I'm like, for the love, like... One time, I'm playing with her on the couch. She threw up in my mouth. I mean, I was like, ah! So I spit it back on her. Like, it was great. It's like, phew, phew. I had it going back and forth. She did not deserve my love. She's five now. She's getting to that age where, like, we were riding down the road the other day, and I've always been right. I've, I'm daddy. I'm always right. But we were riding down the road the other day. She asked me a question. I told her her answer. She said, mm, I don't think I believe that. <laughs> so I put her out and let her walk home and, and, and let her do I didn't. I didn't. But parents, our kids don't work for our love. 
They just receive it. Now, the most common metaphor that Jesus used for God in the scriptures is father. We all have daddy issues. But God is the perfect father. And he, listen, if you belong to Jesus Christ, God doesn't love you because of who you are. God loves you because of who Jesus is in you. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, that means you and me, believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love doesn't make sense. Listen to me. God is not in love with some future version of you. He's not. Because this is where the legalist comes in. They go, okay, God's going to love me because I don't go to rated R movies unless they're about Jesus. And I don't listen to certain kind of music. And I don't drink. And I don't smoke. And I don't do all those things. And hey, if those things stir your affections for Christ, then amen and glory to God. And yes, but I'm telling you, those aren't the reason that God loves us. It's not because of our performance. It's because of our position as his children. Which leads to number two, God's love means complete forgiveness and acceptance. Complete forgiveness and acceptance. God's love means complete forgiveness and acceptance. In other words, if you are a Christian, you're forgiven. You're forgiven for everything in your past. And here's what's beautiful, everything in your future. Jesus didn't pay for your sins when you came to Christ and said, now don't do it again or we're going to have to talk. When Christ died on the cross in John chapter 19, verse 30, he said, it is finished. It is finished in the Greek is to telestai. To telestai literally means the debt is paid in full. And if you're a Christian, you're forgiven. If you're not a Christian today, if you meet Christ, automatic forgiveness. No, I got to work off my sin. No, 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 no. You don't have to work off your sin. The problem is some of us have a problem with God because we don't understand that God's not always bringing up our past. It's the enemy. It's the devil. That's what he does. That's part of his job. How jacked up would it be if I claimed that I love my daughter, but I took four or five of her messiest diapers from the first year of her life. And if you're a parent, you know you had a few. And, and listen, my daughter one time shut down a pool, okay? Like, she shut the pool down. I was like, oh, wow, whose kid is that? Like, I, I, mean, I don't... <laughs> if I would have taken them and put them in plastic baggies, and about once a year I went into a room and I said, hey, remember when you did this? This was horrible. I am embarrassed. Remember when you did this? This was the worst ever. And I went through four or five of those and I zipped them up and said, I love you, baby. Good night. Have a good night's sleep. That's not a loving father. But some of us believe that that's what God does to us. Listen, if you're in Christ, it's not God that keeps bringing up your past. God does love us enough to correct us, but he will not condemn us. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, 1, therefore anyone who is in Christ, I mean, the Bible says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. None. That means we're completely forgiven. One of the phrases we say around here at New Spring all the time is if you don't let your past die, it won't let you live. And I want you to listen to me. I want everybody to listen who struggles with your past. You are not who your sins of your past say you are. That's not who you are. If you're a Christian, you're a brand new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Complete forgiveness. I'll put it to you this way. I, I'm a critical driver. That means I think I drive better than you. And I do. Now, I know there's several of you in the room, mostly men, and you're always evaluating the person if you ride with them. Let's say you got in a car with somebody today. You're leaving the church parking lot and somebody's going to drive you home. But they always looked in the rearview mirror. Like they kept looking in the rearview mirror. Pretty soon you're going to be like, <clears throat> hey, bro. You want to break it down for me while you're looking in the rearview mirror? And they're like, well, I got to see. I, I, let, you would think that's weird if somebody tried to drive that way, but some people here, you're trying to live your life that way. And I believe God's wanting to say to somebody today, stop looking in the rearview mirror and start looking at the windshield. Stop looking at where you were and start looking at where God wants to take you. Because you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Now, that does not mean, well, I can go out here and do whatever I want and come back and say, God, forgive me. Then I can go do whatever I want and come back and say, and I can just kind of be laissez-faire. Because that type of person, here's, well, what's the problem with that? They probably don't know Christ. Because love always seeks 
to give the best and not take advantage of something. Number three, God's love is permanent. Permanent. It means you can't get God to stop loving you. Oh, my gosh. One of the things, when I put Karis to bed about once a week, sometimes twice a week, I'll ask her this question. Baby, and I taught her this, how does daddy love you? Always and forever, no matter what. That's what she says. You can ask her today, how does daddy love you? Always and forever, no matter what. It's the cutest thing in the world. How does daddy love you? Always and forever, no matter what. And so several weeks ago, she lost her first tooth, or several months ago. But the way she lost it was a little weird. It was really loose. And I don't have a problem. Some parents have a problem. I don't have a problem wiggling the tooth and trying to get it out of there and stuff. And I'm, I'm like, baby, it's not coming. So we went to Chick-fil-A one night just to kind of chill. It's like a daddy-daughter date. And that's where we go. A Chick-fil-A or Waffle House? Is she a southern girl or what? Those are the two restaurants she's going to pick. Just telling you. But we went to Chick-fil-A one night and she... <laughs> She's eating chicken nuggets, and I realize her tooth is gone. And I was like, baby, um, you know where your tooth is? She's like, it's in my mouth. I was like, why don't you, why don't you feel up there? And she, she, tried, and she was like, where is it, Daddy? And I was like, um, let's look around. And I, so we're looking. And I, I, I sat her down, and I was like, I was like, baby, you have swallowed your tooth. And this is what I got. Men, you'll, you'll track. This is what I got. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God, we're in Chick-fil-A. I'm like, somebody bring me, bring me a milk. Can we get the cow out here? I, I don't know. what. She is freaking out right now. So we got her home, and I, I, I'm, I'm trying to fix things. That's what men do. So I took a piece of paper and I wadded it up and made it wet it and made it look like a tooth and I was like here's your tooth and like we like the like okay we didn't lie to her we didn't tell her there's a tooth fairy because how jacked up is that hey there's a fairy that loves to collect teeth and he's coming in your room tonight to give you money for your tooth sleep good like we don't do that but we, she did have to have something and, and I remember that night she she thought because she had lost that tooth she thought that I didn't love her she's like but daddy and I was like baby baby let me ask you a question how does daddy love you? Always and forever, no matter what. See, there's some people here that you're struggling with that because you're a Christian. But for whatever reason, you've walked away from God over the past week, month, maybe 10 years. And you won't come back to him because you think he's mad at you. But do you know that when he saved you, he knew you were going to go down the path? You've never done anything to God or in your life that he went, ah, I can't believe you did that. You cannot surprise him. And he loves us always and forever, no matter what. That's, what. that's what the Apostle Paul wrote for us in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 um, and 39. I just want to read this to you. The, the Bible says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So these three points, that God's love does not make sense, that God loves, God's love means complete forgiveness and acceptance, that, that God's love is permanent. Now, I want to read you a Bible story that puts the exclamation point on this. And let me, let me just kind of throw out a, a, a few disclaimers before we read this. The next 30 minutes for some people are going to be the most offensive 30 minutes you've ever spent in church. You're going to be highly offended. Some of you are going to get so angry that you're going to want to walk out. That's fine. It's not like that. It's never happened. I just, I'm just, but I'm not talking to the non-Christians. The non -Christ, if you're not a Christian, if you came here for what somebody told you, you'd meet some, you know, you'll meet somebody cute and you just came or they lied to you or they got you here for whatever reason on whatever campus, you're not going to get offended. You're going to leave going, I didn't know that kind of stuff was in the Bible. It's the people with the church background that are going to get offended. In fact, let me say this. The more of a church background you have, the more likely you're going to get really upset in the next 30 minutes. And here's why. Most people from a church background have never heard the story I'm about to read. It's awkward. It is uncomfortable. Highly. But... I believe that all scripture is from God. 
I believe that every verse was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so, with, with that, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, for those of you that have a G-rated view of God, your world is about to get blown up. The Bible is not G-rated. God is not the genie, and Jesus is not Aladdin riding around on his magic carpet trying to make everybody happy. There are some really weird, uncomfortable stories in the Bible. And you, if you grew up in church, especially in the South, we did, like remember we had the flannel graph? and so, You can't flannel graph this story. And if you did, you would get fired from your church. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. In fact, turn to your neighbor right now and say, it is about to get awkward up in here on every campus. I didn't say to say anything else. I just said, yeah, see, it's already awkward. Now, how many people on all of our campuses, you've heard the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors? Joseph and the coat of many colors. Okay, yeah, yeah, most, most people, yeah, you got that, right? There's a man in the scripture, his name's Jacob. He had 12 sons. And uh, one of them was Joseph, made him coach, coat of many colors. But then after that story, we always hear he went to Potiphar's house. And you know, that's Genesis 37. And then Genesis 39, he sold into slavery. Nobody talks about Genesis 38. Because Genesis 38 is awkward. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Genesis 38. And if you got one of those little ribbon things, just go ahead and mark Matthew 1 because we're going to go there too. It's about to get awkward. I'm telling you, if, you got a, if your teenager's sitting next to you right now, you're probably not going to want to make eye contact with them at any point for the rest of the message. Just look at the preacher, okay? Or pretend you are. Close your eyes and pretend you're praying. I'm telling you, awkward. Here we go. Genesis 38. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Agilom named Hira. Let me explain Judah for just a second. Judah's one of the sons of Jacob. Jacob would eventually have 12 sons where the 12 tribes of Israel would come from. One of those tribes he was going to use to bring about the Messiah. We call him Jesus, and he's the reason that we get to be right with God. Okay, so pretty important group of people here. One of those sons is named Judah, and Judah, the Bible says Judah went away. Judah walked away from his father. Judah walked away from his brothers, and he went to another place, which anytime we see this in Scripture, it's always going to go bad because he walked away from a community of people that could have helped him really remain strong in Christ. He just... He walked away from them. And I'm telling you, this is what happens with so many people. We get so obsessed with what we think we want to do. I, I Listen, for 20 years I've been in ministry. And for 20 years I've seen people make big mistakes in their life. And you know what most of them have in common? At some point they decided, you know what, I don't need Jesus. I don't need church. I don't need these things. I'm going to walk away. And that always goes bad. Judah's story is about to go bad. That's why we tell people, hey, church is important. That's why we're doing these community groups. Some of you on all of your campuses, they talked about the community groups, the evangelism groups. I'm telling you, six weeks of your life, if you'll give six weeks of your life to that group, I'll guarantee you your faith in Christ will increase and your, your walk with Jesus will go to another level. Just kind of a little plug right there. We're going to go on to verse two. Here we go. There Judah met a daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and made love to her. All the married people said amen. 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 Yeah. Praise God in the house. Mm. Kind of felt like right there we needed a little wow, 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 wow. I, I, I kind of felt that. Oh, by the way, that's not the awkward part. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son whose name was Ur. I don't know if you got a baby name book, but I'll get like... How did that happen? Hey, Judah, what you want to name your son? Er, hey, that's good. I'm going to write that down. Er, all right, got it. <laughs> she conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kazib that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Everybody say Tamar. Tamar. Yeah. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. It's got God killing people right there in verse 7. Here we go. Then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife. 
Okay, that needs a little explanation because that would be weird, right? The father stands up, the father-in-law stands up at the Thanksgiving dinner and goes, you need to have sex with your sister-in-law. That's bizarre. So let me just explain what this is so you'll understand. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm not even saying I like it. I'm just saying this is how it was back in the day. If a man died and he had no son, his brother would come in and sleep with his sister-in-law. If she gave birth to a son, that son would carry on the dead father's name so the name of the family would not die out. So it's weird, but that's just the way it was. A little explanation right here. So then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife and to fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. Let me pause right here. This next verse is weird. Like m- Many of us have Christian t-shirts with verses on them. Good verses, right? Like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a good workout verse, right? You cut the sleeves out of that shirt. That's a good one. Some of you have, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul panteth for you. If you're a dude, I probably wouldn't wear that shirt. But, but I mean, maybe it's great for the women's ministry people. I, I don't know. This next verse is not a t-shirt verse. But for church people, I want you to listen to me. It's in the Bible. So I'm just going to read it and let it sit there. But Onan knew that when the child would not be his, Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring for his brother. It's weird, isn't it? A lot of people looking at me. Don't look at your teenager right now. Don't, 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 don't. Yeah. <laughs> what he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death also. God's killing everybody. Hide your kids, hide your wife. God's, kill, like God's killing everybody right here. <laughs> Little tension breaker. That was good, wasn't it? All right, here we go. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up, for he thought he may die too, just like his brother. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. Don't miss this. This is what he did. Judah's sitting there going, two of my sons have died as a result of being with that woman. Now, he probably don't know everything that's going on. He's got another son. He's like, I'm not going to give her to like the black widow over here. All right, She's killing everybody. So here's the deal. Why don't you go live with your daddy? <clears throat> Probably going to kill him too. Why don't you go live with your daddy and I'll keep my son over here and I'll raise him. And what he's thinking is maybe she'll forget. We're about to see that in the story. Watch this. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah to, men, to the men who were shearing his sheep and his friends here of the Adjumite went with him. Now, This is where Jerry Springer meets the Bible. What we're about to read, like Jerry Springer would go, that's flipping weird. I I don't even think, I don't think we can do a show on that. Like this is weird, but it's in the scripture. So let's just read it and see what happens. When Tamar was told your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then went down to the, at the entrance to Enum, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that though Sheila had now grown up, she had not been given to him, uh, she had not been given to him as his wife. So she's upset because Judah's holding out on her. Judah's not giving her the son, and she's mad. So she decides to do what many times we all do and take things on our own hand. Verse 15 When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. I want to stop right here and just say, What we see in this passage is Tamar, and she represents the sinner. The sinner is somebody who's simply chosen to tell God, I don't trust you. I'm going to take things in my own hands. I'm going to live my own way. Because, God, I can't trust you. I can't trust what you say about relationships. I can't trust what you say about finances. I cannot trust what you say about work ethics. I cannot trust what you say about eternity. So here's the deal, God. 
I'm going to take things in my own hand. I'm going to live my own way. I'm going to make my own decisions. And maybe one day if things get really bad, I might ask you for help. But if you help me, it's not really going to help me because I'm going to just go back and dive into whatever I was doing before. She's the sinner. Let me just say for the record, I know that's who I was. When I came to church, I kind of felt like I needed a name tag when I first started coming to church that said sinner on it. Every, not only did I know I was a sinner, like everybody that sat around me knew, like, like the preacher would share certain illustrations and be like, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know if you ever got that. But today, there are some people here that know that that's, what you're, that's the life you're living right now. You've chosen to tell God, I don't trust you. I'm going to take my life into my own hands. I'm going to do things my own way. And listen to me, that always goes bad. I had a friend say this, and it's so true, and I said it several months ago, but I'll say it again. No one has caused you more hurt in your life than you. You. And it's simply when we choose to say, God, I don't trust you, so I'm going to handle things my way. But not only do you have the sinner, you have another character in the story, Judah. Watch this. Verse 16, not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you? She asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Is that weird? I don't, like, I don't know if that was a pickup line back in the day. Hey, baby, you want a goat? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying... Don't write that down. Don't put that on a girl's Facebook. Hey, baby, you want to go? Like, I don't think that's going to... No, freak. Um, but evidently, this worked back in the day, right? I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Now watch her. She's pretty smart. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it, she asked. He said, what pledge should I give you? Watch this. Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. Now, to us, that doesn't mean very much. But men, she was essentially saying, I want your driver's license and I want your social security card. A man's, let me me just read this, his seal and cord and the staff, that was his identity. And she said, I want you to give me your identity. And don't miss this, this isn't the sermon, but it's a part of the sermon, and I want to call it out. Anytime we have sex with someone that we're not married to, we give them just a little bit of our identity. People go, it's not a big deal. It's just physical. And I would argue it is a big deal because to do it, you had to give away your identity. Just in the text, just wanted to bring it out. So he gave them to her. Gave up his identity. And slept with her and she became pregnant by him. Her father-in-law. See how weird this is? Well, it gets weirder. After she, um, after she left, verse 19, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by, the, by his friend, the Adamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who was beside the road at Enium? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So when Judah, so he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her besides the men who lived there said, there hasn't been any shrine prostitutes here. Then Judah said, let her keep what she has or we will become a laughingstock. He didn't know the Bible was being written. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. Don't miss this. We have Tamar the sinner, but we have Judah the self-righteous. Notice what Judah, Judah had sex in his mind with a prostitute, not knowing it was his daughter-in-law, which means you can't have sex with someone but not be intimate with them because he didn't even know who she was. But then he sends her the goat. And the guy comes back and goes, she wasn't there. And this was his answer. I sent her the goat. He wasn't willing to acknowledge his sin. He was like, hey, I sent her the goat and she wasn't there. Her bad. In Judah's response, we see a self-righteous attitude. So we have Tamar the sinner. We have Judah the self-righteous. Watch how self-righteous Judah is. Watch this. This is crazy. 
About three months later, verse 24, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. Nobody in here right now is a fan of Judah. Like nobody here on any campus, watching online, listening on podcasts, nobody is like, Judah's the man. Everybody here, I will bet you, is going, he is scum of the earth. But you know what? He's self-righteous. Self-righteous people are obsessed with the sins of others so they don't have to confess their own sin. And self-righteous people don't understand that they need the same love and grace and mercy of God, and if not, they're in trouble. Hey, my story is simply this. God saved me from the pit. When Jesus became my Savior, when I surrendered my life to Christ, became a Christian, whatever you want to call it, he saved me from the pit. I was in despair. I was hopeless, and he saved me. Now, I'm just really curious on all of our campuses, how many of you who are Christians would say that Jesus saved you from the pit? Would you raise your hand? Okay, lots of people, lots of hands raised on all those campuses, I'm sure. Now, put your hands down. For those of you that are Christians and did not raise your hand, what did he save you from? That's the issue, is a lot of Christians don't understand what they were saved from. Because in this story, Tamar needed someone to save her, and so did Judah. Judah was not any better than Tamar. If he didn't save you from the pit, what did he save you from? Because the Bible says in Ephesians 2 that all of us who did not know Christ at once, we were objects of wrath. The, self, the sinner and the self-righteous, object of wrath. We were without hope. We were without God. But God in his mercy reached down and saved the sinner And the self-righteous. Both need the love of God or we're in a lot of trouble. Amen? I'm just telling everybody here today that if it were not for the love of God. See, see, I have some people go, well, Perry, that's not true about me. I mean, I'm not sure he saved me from the pit because I was born into a Christian home. And my parents taught me Bible stories and growing up. And I prayed to receive Christ when I was five, six, or seven. And listen, listen, listen. Amen and yes, And glory be to God. I celebrate that. I celebrate you if that is your story. But here's the deal. I would point back and say it's the mercy and love and grace of God that he allowed you to be born in that home. Because there's a lot of people that weren't born into that home. And he allowed you to be born into that home so you could meet him early so he could keep you on the right path from the very beginning of your life. You should be the most passionate person in worship because he saved you early and he has kept you from falling for all these years. The sinner and the self-righteous desperately need the love of God or we're in trouble. So Judah said, bring her out and burn her, right? What do you do with witches? Burn! Anyway, there we go. I had to break the tension. I felt it in the room. Verse 25, watch this. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose whose seal and cord and staff these are. Hey, Judah, Judah, okay, okay, I'm going to go burn to death. But before I do, you know what this is? And Judah's like... Oh, shoot. (laughs) Watch what he says. Watch what he says. Verse 26, Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I. Well, thank you very much. That's an unbelievable standard. Thank you, mister. I went and had sex with a prostitute on the side of the road, and she was my (laughs) daughter-in-law. She's more righteous than I. Since I wouldn't give her to my son, Shelah, never acknowledged his sin. He said, I wouldn't get, never acknowledged that he had sex with a prostitute. See, self-righteous people cannot acknowledge their sin. But everybody here can see it in Judah. The problem is when we can't see it in ourself. 
She's more righteous than I since um, I wouldn't give my son, give her to my son Sheila, and he did not sleep with her again. Now it gets weirder. Watch this, verse 27. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. So she's not going to give birth to one. She's going to give birth to two. Now it's weird. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand. I don't know what that's like. I'm just reading the Bible, right? Isn't that what the Bible says? So the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, this one came out first. Like, I don't, I'm imagining like a rodeo. Like when the hand came out, she was like. Shh. I just read the Bible this way sometimes, okay? But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out. So he pulled back his hand. His brother was like. Oh, phew, phew. And she said. So this is now, so this is how you have broken out. And his name was Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out. And he was named Zara. Can we agree that's the most awkward story in the Bible? Yes. We got somebody clapping. Yes. My middle schooler is with me, and I'm going to have to have a conversation on the way home. Praise God. Amen. That's awkward. I remember the first time I read that. Listen, listen, look, you, you can't flannel graph that, right? You, you, you know what? You know, I'm just going to fire myself. I, I don't even know. I don't even know. I don't, like, it's awkward. So the first time I'm reading the Bible, nobody ever taught on that. I'm reading Genesis 38. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go to 39 and read about Joseph. Like, I, did, I didn't know. How to handle that? Like, what? Okay, God, here's my thing. Why is that story in there? It took me all the way back to the first time I started reading the Bible. I didn't start in Genesis. Some people go, I'm going to read, through, I'm going to start in Genesis, and I'm going to read straight through. For most people, that's a really bad idea. You know why? Because you're going to get, like, you're going to stop in Leviticus. They're going to start killing goats, and, and like, it just gets crazy. So I always tell people, start with Matthew. Read through the New Testament. So I started with Matthew. Well, if you start in Matthew 1... Like, that bothered me, too, because it's like so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. And you're like, what the? Like, can we just get to the story? Why you got to talk about somebody begatting? And I remember I asked, what does begat mean? Go ask your mom. Go ask your dad. Like, so I didn't even know what the, I was like, why won't somebody talk to me about begat? And it, that was King James Version, by the way. And so I'm running all over the house trying to figure out what's going on. And I, I, mean, I got to be honest with you. For years, I would look at Matthew chapter 1 and just be frustrated like why is this story in the bible god but god showed me something recently in matthew 1 in fact he reiterated he reiterated something that i think we say around here all the time that every number has a name and every name has a story and every story matters to god think about this for a second if you're god and you're getting ready to choose one of the sons of Jacob that you're going to bring the lineage of Jesus out of him. You don't pick Judah. Judah, the guy that had sex with his daughter-in-law. Judah, the self-righteous guy that abused and manipulated his daughter-in-law. You don't, and, and, and you definitely aren't picking Tamar. Because she took things in her own hand and did not trust the Lord. With that in mind, I want you to just read with me Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 1, where it talks about the lineage of Jesus. These are the people who are in Christ. These are the people that God used to bring about the Messiah from whom all of us benefit. And just watch this, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. 
God reached into the mess and pulled out the Messiah. And if God can reach into that mess and pull out something great, he can reach into yours. I don't care how messed up you are today. I don't care how messed up of a past you have. The love of God is way bigger than any junk you brought in here today. And I believe with all my heart that God is trying his best to get to somebody today and tell you, I love you always and forever, no matter what. For the Christian that you've walked away from God, like you have walked away from God. And I don't have to map it out for you because you know you've walked away from God. He's asking you today just to come home because his love is bigger than the mess you made. Listen, if he can use Judah and Tamar, there is still hope for your future. Stop looking in the rearview mirror and start looking in the windshield because God has a plan for your life that would blow your mind. But you've got to get out of your past and you've got to get over your past because God's gotten over it through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus paid for that sin on the cross. And today you've got to step out. Listen, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, while he's away, all the while, there's a party waiting on him at his home. And his dad had hired a DJ, and his dad was getting re- his dad was ready to kill the fattened calf. And the Bible says that the dancing could be heard. And I mean, it was unbelievable. All the prodigal son had to do was stop feeling sorry for himself and just come home. And there are people here today that you're not a Christian. You don't know Christ. You know that if you were to die today, you would spend eternity in hell. But more than that, you've got to live for the rest of the day without Jesus, which is just as big of a tragedy. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, and I don't care who you are, and I don't care what you've done. Today, you can receive Christ in your life. And you know what? That's for the sinner who, know you, need, who, who you know you need him, and that's for the self-righteous person that's like, I think I'm a good person. I don't need Jesus. I would simply say, then why did he die on the cross? The love of God does not make sense. The love of God means complete forgiveness and acceptance. And God's love is permanent. What he did for Judah and Tamar, he wants to do for you. On all of our campuses, can we stand for prayer? And I'm going to ask everyone not to leave. I know we love to get out of here and beat people to lunch or dinner or whatever. But we're going to have a moment together as a church to celebrate something. If everybody's standing, would you pray with me? Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus... God, to just put an exclamation point on this message because I know that so many of us needed to hear that today. There are people in this room, Jesus, that they're Christians. They have prayed to receive you into their life, but God, for whatever reason, and everybody has a story, God, but for whatever reason, they've, they've walked away and they feel condemned, they feel beat up, they feel like they can't come home. God, I pray that you would speak to their heart right now. And you would remind them that you love us because of our position and not because of our performance. And Father, I pray for the person here that does not know you. And Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you that during this time, you would speak to their hearts and draw them to you in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed on both campuses, we're going to sing a song. We're going to sing a song together as a church. And I'm going to ask you to sing it. It's one of our favorites if you've been around here for a while. But the But the chorus, I mean, where we really break it down is where we begin to sing. It's called He Loves Me. And we sing a verse that says, He is our portion and we are his prize, drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If his grace is an ocean, we're we're all sinking. And then it says this, when heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss, my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way he loves me. My past is, it's the rear view mirror and I'm looking in the windshield. And on all of our campuses, as we sing this song, here's what I wanna invite you to do today. If you need someone to pray with you or pray for you because you feel like you're that prodigal and God's calling you home, during this song, I just want you to walk out of the auditorium, whatever auditorium you're in, you just walk out the back doors and people from our care team would love to pray with you and pray for you. 
If you're here today on all of our campuses and you know that you need Jesus in your life, you're not a Christian, you want to talk to somebody about that, this unconditional, unfathomable love during this song, listen to me. You just move out of your aisle and go out that back door and tell the person out there, I need to talk to somebody about receiving Jesus. People did it in the previous services. They'll do it in this service. I'm telling you, if God spoke to your heart, you move. And then on all of our campuses, we've talked about baptism for the past several weeks. And some of you are like, I know I need to get baptized today. We're baptizing after this service. And many of you know that you need to get baptized. You haven't signed up. But you know what? Today is the day you can get baptized. Here's why. You say, well, I didn't bring anything. That's cool. We knew you didn't bring anything, so we brought it for you. We've got shirts. We've got shorts. We've got towels. We've got hair nets. We've got everything you would need to get baptized. And listen, during the song, if you know that's you, you just go to the back and you tell the person back there, I need to, I need to get baptized. For the rest of us, we're going to sing this song, and I want you to sing this song, listen, like you're forgiven, like you mean it, and lift up the name of Jesus who saves the sinner and the self-righteous. Father, I pray that during these next few moments as a church on every campus, you would burn this moment into our minds and may we just celebrate your unconditional love. We ask this in Jesus' name.